evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. Coming up, these researchers are looking at trees. This photograph was taken from a mountain in 1963. Here's what the same area looked like 20 years later. To find out why, researchers began gathering samples of dying trees on various parts of the mountain. Recognized as a world leader in academic teaching and research, Glasgow is Britain's fourth oldest university and in 2001 celebrated its 550th anniversary. Students from more than 80 countries study here, drawn by the combination of a vibrant Scottish city and a university with a worldwide reputation in both arts and sciences. And Mercury Redstone too. Before man flights into space, the first explorers were animals. We look at a chimp named Ham, his venture into space and the recovery of his spacecraft. In some countries, it's known dramatically as the death of the forests. All over the world, large wooded areas, once lush and green, are now sickly and grey. Seeking reasons for this dramatic decline, scientists have been studying the problem on Camel's Hump Mountain in Vermont, USA. This photograph was taken from Camel's Hump in 1963. Here's what the same area looked like 20 years later. To find out why, researchers began gathering samples of dying trees on various parts of the mountain. These samples, bagged and labelled in the field, will later be analysed in area laboratories. One theory why forests are dying is what's popularly referred to as acid rain. Pollutants caused by the burning of fossil fuels get into the atmosphere. They're then moved around our planet by air currents and fall back to Earth in the rain and are absorbed by the plants and trees. Based on the analysis of the samples collected on Camel's Hump, scientists are not convinced that acid rain is the sole cause of the problem, but they do think it's a factor. Specially equipped aircraft and satellites are also being used in the investigation to produce imagery of the study sites. Because the health of a plant or tree determines how it shows up in these images, they provide a very accurate way of discovering, mapping and monitoring damaged areas. Scientists plan to use even more advanced airborne instruments to detect the first stages of forest decline before it becomes obvious. Small Vermont sawmills and the worldwide lumber industry in general could soon begin to feel the impact of what has become known as the death of the forest. But the problem goes beyond economic concerns and scientists believe that we will have to find means of improving the atmospheric conditions. For that reason, these damage assessment efforts are vital as we look at the trees to save the forests. Glasgow University in Scotland is Britain's fourth oldest university and a world leader in academic teaching and research. The art, the architecture, the history, Glasgow is the heart of Scotland. It's an active city, the people have a reputation for friendliness and for any student it provides a beautiful backdrop for study. The students are proud of their university, of its heritage in the arts and sciences. Most come from Scotland, but a growing number come here from elsewhere in the British Isles and from around 80 overseas countries. 
The university is celebrating its 550th anniversary and Vice-Chancellor Professor Graham Davis says diversity is its strength. Konstantin Sor joined the music faculty six months ago. He came from Romania to study in Glasgow as a way of improving his performance as a musician. One of the most popular courses at Glasgow, especially amongst overseas students, is Scottish studies. Glasgow is the fourth oldest university in Britain and is keen to promote its heritage. This class is studying Scottish literature, a subject often overlooked in traditional English literature courses. For the students who want to keep fit, Glasgow University has just invested millions of pounds in sports facilities. This gym is available to all 16,000 students on campus for just four pounds a year. That includes aerobics classes, the gym, squash courts, and the use of two swimming pools. But it isn't all just fun. Glasgow is also a leading university for sport research. Sports science and sport medicine are two courses renowned throughout the world. Another area of excellence is veterinary science. Professor Julie Fitzpatrick is working on a research project based in Africa, studying the importance of disease in cattle for local farmers. Members of Glasgow University working on the mastitis research project shot this video. Many of the local cattle owners have just one or two cows each, and they're being taught how to test them for disease and to give simple treatment. Members gave them their ideas and together they created methods that would work for their particular surroundings. As part of the project, Joseph Magona, a PhD student from Uganda, has joined Glasgow research team. He's working on adapting this machine, which tests blood for signs of anemia for use in the field. Students in both the science and art faculties have access to excellent library facilities. There are special courses in how to use them for overseas students. As well as being a place for teaching, the university itself is also one of the largest research bases in the UK, with grants and contracts worth some £60 million a year. On the leading edge of this research is the Department of Nanotechnology. Here they make microchips and condense information onto small disks. The joke around the university is that this department is so successful they've moved to smaller premises. So Dr. Ian Thane is working in communications. His aim is to get information like real-time video download moving quicker and more clearly to a very small screen such as a mobile phone. The hurry bell sounds every hour on the hour as a signal for students to hurry to their next lesson. Most lectures, especially in the arts, are centered around the main quadrangle. This is also where, at the end of their course, students will sit their exams. There's also a more modern tradition that's taken off over the past few years, a game called Ultimate Frisbee. Believe it or not, this is now a serious sport, with the university taking part in international competition. But for most students, the heritage of the university is the main attraction of Glasgow. The War for Independence, which these Scottish students are reenacting, and the distinct Scottish culture. Wherever they come from, whatever subjects they study academically, Scotland becomes a way of life, something all students take away with them when they graduate. Before men flights into space, the first explorers were animals. This is Mercury Redstone 2, MR2, another stepping stone towards manned spaceflight. Personnel are applying finishing touches to a specially modified Redstone. The rocket's autopilot will control the flight path from liftoff at Cape Canaveral until burn up in space. This is the Redstone rocket motor, 
78,000 pounds of fiery thrust. In McDonald's surgically clean white room, the MR2 craft nears completion. Electronic systems to control automatic equipment in the craft after separation in the booster must be checked and rechecked. The retrograde rockets will be tested in space. The antenna housing will transmit telemetry. The heat shield must be inspected carefully before attachment to the craft. The MR2 will carry a specially trained chimpanzee who will ride in a custom-made couch equipped with levers that he will operate in response to flashing coloured lights. His responses will be recorded for aeromedical analysis. As the launch date nears, capsule number 5 undergoes a complete systems check and is then airlifted for final testing before launch. The pre-launch tempo is increased. Now the chimpanzees arrive at Cape Canaveral. One will be selected for flight. The environmental control system in the capsule is tested in a pressurized chamber and the chimpanzees are subjected to the same pressure and oxygen conditions that the astronauts will encounter when manned flights begin. One at a time, the chimpanzees are acclimated to the couch and the spacecraft through simulated flights in the pressure chamber. Reactions of the chimps during the tests are carefully monitored as their training continues. Originally selected for the MR2 flights because of their physical and mental characteristics, the chimps turn out to be, it seems, very adaptable pupils. Meanwhile, testing of the spacecraft continues. A landing impact bag used for the first time on MR2 will get a performance checkout. The landing impact bag designed to reduce the shock at landing by 25% is formed by the heat shield, a flexible skirt and the base of the craft itself. During the capsule's parachute descent after re-entry, the heat shield will be extended some four feet and air holes in the flexible skirt will enable the container thus formed to fill with air. Upon impact, the air will breathe out through the holes to ease the shock of landing. In the case of a water landing, such as is planned for MR2, the bag will fill with water in order to improve the stability of the craft during wind and wave action. Not too many days later, the Redstone launch vehicle arrives at Cape Canaveral. The modified Redstone with its Mercury craft stands 84 feet high and measures 70 inches in diameter. Its takeoff weight is more than 66,000 pounds. The Redstone engine delivers approximately 77,000 pounds of thrust. After another round of testing, the MR2 booster is taken to the launch pad and raised into its launch position. The structural steel gantry around the launch pad permits ready access to the rocket and the spacecraft as they're prepared for flight. The spacecraft gets a final check for perfect weight and balance. Everything must be just as right as human minds can make it. Then the escape tower is attached to the top of the spacecraft and of course checked for perfect alignment. A solid propellant rocket is attached to the top of the tower which will separate the craft from the redstone in the event of an emergency during pre-launch or during the powered portion of the flight. The Mercury craft and its redstone meet at the launch pad. 
The pre-planned flight path for MR2 defines a ballistic trajectory 254 miles downrange from launch to touchdown. The spacecraft is to reach a maximum altitude of 120 statute miles. The chimp is to undergo about four and a half minutes of weightlessness. The Redstone booster will burn for approximately two and a half minutes, reaching a velocity of almost 5,000 miles per hour. At booster shutdown, the escape tower will be jettisoned. Ten seconds later, the posigrade rockets fire to separate the craft from the Redstone booster. Total flight time, 15 and a half minutes. The next decision, which chimpanzee to send on the flight. Each of the candidates gets a complete medical checkup. Weight, temperature, heart, ears, eyes, blood pressure and throat. And the honour goes to an astro chimp named Ham. A friendly little fellow in a form-fitted couch about to make his mark in history. Ham is laced into his couch and wired for sound. Electrodes on his feet will give him a gentle shock in case he forgets to pull the levers. But Ham learned his lesson well. The red lever at least every 20 seconds for the red light and the white lever for the blue light. Next step, a dress rehearsal. On the MR2 flight, Ham is a stand-in for the astronaut. He arrives on the scene at the same van that will be used by the astronaut. The form-fitting couch is like the one that the astronaut will use. The first United States astronaut will take the same van out to the same launch pad and up the same elevator to the top of the rocket and into the Mercury spacecraft just as Ham is doing today. The astronaut will go through this same kind of dress rehearsal. Indeed, about the only difference is that the first astronaut will climb aboard the spacecraft in his own pressurized suit and into a couch previously installed for him. The spacecraft in which the first astronaut will ride is almost identical to this one. The environmental control system is the same and the automatic attitude control system is identical. Ham's dress rehearsal is perfect and the launch is set. The order goes out for the spacecraft recovery forces to proceed to the landing area. As the ships deploy, Operations personnel in the Mercury Control Center prepare to monitor the flight. The countdown begins, 320 minutes to launch. Tanks of liquid oxygen arrive and fueling begins. The Redstone rocket burns a mixture of alcohol and liquid oxygen. Throughout the night, the countdown continues. And in the pre-dawn hours, Ham arrives at the gantry. This time, it's for real. When he arrives at the top of the gantry, he'll find astronaut Alan Shepard on hand to observe the preparations, the launch, and certainly to wish him good luck on his flight. At dawn, the recovery ships are on station and a Cape Canaveral MR2 with Ham aboard is ready. The medical monitor shows that Ham is resting quietly, his heart beats steady, respiration normal. Now it's time to pull the gantry back. MR2 nears launch time. In the control room, Quiet efficiency is the only outward sign. The flight director presides over the countdown. Four, three, two, one, zero, liftoff. And Ham is on his way.
In the control center, the flight surgeon's eyes are glued to his console, monitoring Ham's condition. Concern mounts. Ham's heartbeat and respiration climb fast. MR2 now leaves a visible trail and it's flying higher and faster than it should. An abort condition is indicated, something is wrong. But with the abort system operative, the Mercury craft begins to behave exactly as programmed. The flight surgeon watches the monitor and now Ham is doing better. His heart and respiration rates drop to almost normal. The life support system seems to be working properly. MR2 is up over the top and re-entry begins. On a condensed time scale, this is the re-entry sequence. Deploy the drug chute, mortar off the antenna housing to deploy the main parachute. At touchdown, jettison the main parachute because the recovery forces are on the move. The Mercury craft landed further downrange than programmed. The crews of the ships follow the signals. The spacecraft is spotted from the air and its position radioed to the recovery ship. The recovery ship plots a new course and takes a new heading. Full steam ahead is the order and then some. Eventually the ship rendezvous with the capsule to rescue the very important passenger. Wave action during the recovery phase has torn off the impact bag. The moment is tense. All concerned are now aware that the spacecraft traveled 40 miles higher and 120 miles farther than scheduled. The engine shut down a fraction of a second earlier than it should have. The abort system worked, but Ham sustained 18 Gs instead of the 11 that was expected. The hero chimp was, however, fine, and the MR2 was successful. Test objectives were achieved. Mercury systems worked in space. A man could have made the trip into space and back safely. MR2 was a significant milestone on the highway to man flights into space. The evidence is a somewhat confused champion chimp. Thank you.